Welcome back and I've got an absolutely fascinating experiment to show you today. This one is called Brownian motion and it took Einstein to explain what was going on. So, in a minute I'm going to explain the setup I've got here and how I get it working. But to begin with, let's have a quick look at Brownian motion. So, if you look at this little bit of video, you'll notice that you see lots of little white dots whizzing around all over the place randomly and going in and out of the field of view. And what they are, are very small particles of smoke. And uh, I've got a microscope and what I'm doing is I'm looking at smoke in a tiny little test tube. And uh, those little particles are whizzing around all over the place randomly. That's going to take quite a bit of explaining. But first, I'm going to show you the setup and how I managed to view the smoke in the little tiny test tube. So the way to view Brownian motion in a school laboratory is to use something wonderfully called the Whitley Bay smoke cell. And I presume it's named after a, a school that invented it. I'm not sure, but it's been around for as long as I've been doing physics anyway. So I've got a microscope here and a power supply. And on the stage of the microscope, um, I've got a lamp, uh, a lens, and then a little tiny test tube. I'll show you that closer up in a minute. And what we're going to do is we're going to put some smoke in the tiny test tube, put a cover slip on the top to keep it in, and then we're going to look down the microscope and view what those smoke particles are doing. And it's the light bulb here that's going to illuminate them so we can see them clearly. OK, so let's have a look at our smoke cell. So uh, what I've got here is the little tiny test tube that we're going to put the smoke in. Um, it's a tiny little container. Um, you really need a clean one, so this needs cleaning. It's got a bit um, sort of uh, tarred up, etc. And in a minute, I'll put some smoke into this little tiny test tube. And then I'll just put a cover slip on top um, to keep the smoke in. Uh, then there's two other components to this here is um, a horizontal filament light bulb. So if I plug it into a power supply and turn it up, I won't do it fully bright. Um, you can see the light bulb. And that light bulb um, sheds light in all directions, I suppose, but into this glass rod. Now, if you think about it, a glass rod is convex. So it acts like a convex lens and takes the light that's spreading out from this filament lamp and it brings it inwards and make sure that the light is going into this little tiny test tube. So what we've got sitting on the stage of the microscope is a little tube of smoke, a light bulb and a lens to shine that light in horizontally into the smoke container. And that light will reflect off the smoke particles. Um, it, it shows up as white light. OK, they look very um, bright and white. And then that light will make its way up uh, the microscope and we can view the image. So the only thing I've got to do now is show you how do I get smoke into that little tiny test tube. So the way to get the smoke into the little tube down there is quite clever. You take um, an art straw like a paper art straw, um, and light the end of the art straw. OK, and here's the clever bit. You let it burn and then you tip it. See the smoke coming out? There we go. Loads of smoke coming out the end of the straw if you hold it vertically. And now I've got a test tube that's full of grey smoke and I can put the lid on. And then all we need to do is put that under the microscope and view what's going on in there. So if you look at this photograph, this is a stationary picture and not knowing about Brownian motion, this is possibly what you'd expect to see. You'd expect to see the little smoke particles as little white dots and they'd be stationary. 
Uh, they might be drifting downwards, um, uh, drawn down by their weight in the gravitational field, uh, but you don't expect anything odd to happen. You just expect to see the little dots. But when you look at it, not in a still photograph, but you look at it down a microscope, um, you'll notice what you see is completely different. You'll also note a couple of other things as well, that uh, sometimes they all seem to have a drift velocity. They all seem to move slightly sideways in one direction. You could ignore that. That's just convection currents in the little test tube that contains the smoke uh, caused by heating from the lamp. The other thing uh, that happens is they seem to sort of pop into life and then disappear. Uh, that too is not what's happening. Um, they're actually moving um, upwards or downwards in that case, and they're going out of the field of view of the microscope. So the ones you see best are the ones that stay on a flat horizontal plane, and you see them jiggling around and moving in random directions. So the history of this experiment is somewhat confused and there seem to be arguments about what actually happened. But in 1827, uh, a Scottish botanist called Robert Boyle supposedly was looking at um, plants and how they reproduced and was looking down a microscope at some pollen grains in water. I've read different accounts from um, quite learned uh, societies who say that it wasn't pollen grains he was looking at, but it doesn't really change the explanation. Um, there's also evidence that someone before him uh, was looking at um, coal dust to see what it looked like, sort of black dust, a bit like our smoke in our smoke cell. And uh, when both of the scientists looked, they noticed when they looked down their microscopes that uh, the pollen grains or the smoke uh, particles or the coal dust didn't sit still. It seemed to wriggle around. Now, what's interesting about this is going back to Boyle, is Boyle was a botanist and he was interested in what caused life. And of course, pollen grains are one of the things that are needed to cause plants to reproduce. So if you can see pollen grains wiggling around and whizzing around in um, water, in a liquid, under a microscope, I wonder if that's the lifeness, the lifeblood that is taken on to the next plant to make it grow. Well, that's perhaps not the case. So the reason that Robert Brown got this phenomenon named after him was he investigated it a bit further. So there's the idea that pollen grains contain some kind of life spirit and that's why they're jiggling around all over the place, which proved to be wrong, because he then investigated inanimate objects, things a bit like the coal dust, etc. And when looked at through a microscope, they did exactly the same thing. So what we've got here is very small particles in either a gas or a liquid, and they just won't sit still. They keep wiggling around all over the place, and whether they've come from a living plant or from a dead object like a piece of coal or a rock or smoke, they do the same thing. And the explanation didn't come along until Einstein in 1905. So at the turn of the century, um, or just before then, a lot of science was being done to see whether atoms existed and molecules. Um, they hadn't really been properly detected, but we had radioactivity, uh, some chemistry evidence, and this experiment is really, really good evidence for the existence of atoms and molecules. So Einstein came along and gave some thought to this. And this random walk, this vibration and movement of the particles can be explained by knowing that molecules and atoms exist. So here goes for an explanation. You've got to remember that uh, the smoke particles in this experiment or the pollen grains, you can consider them as being quite large on an atomic or molecular scale. And instead of just sitting still or lying on the bottom of the test tube, they whiz around, something is causing them to move. And the genius of Einstein was to say that if they're being pushed in one direction and then pushed in another direction and then pushed in another direction, there must be a force, there must be a collision, there must be a momentum change, something must be changing their direction. And if you can't see that thing, then you must assume that what's hitting the quite large pollen grains or smoke particles are objects that are extremely small 
and very, very fast moving. And there is really good evidence for the existence of atoms and molecules in a gas. So there we go, Brownian motion explained. So you have to imagine that the smoke particles are sitting in a sea of molecules, that's the, the air, and the air molecules, that's nitrogen and oxygen, are very, very, very small indeed. So small that you can't see them, not even with a microscope. But if they can move a relatively large smoke particle, they must be moving very, very fast indeed and having collisions with the smoke particles, causing them to jiggle about and slowly but surely move around the field of view in a random direction. So Einstein managed to explain that and it's really, really good evidence for the existence of atoms which are very, very small and if they're in a gas, they're moving freely and very fast. So it might be worth asking, what happens if we cool this experiment down? Well, the gas particles in my laboratory at room temperature are on average moving at about 500 meters per second. So they're having quite fast collisions with the smoke particles. So if we were to cool this apparatus down, the gas in the room would slow down and you would see Brownian motion slow down less and less and less. And finally, when we got to close to absolute zero, assuming things were the same and it was a gas, etc. This random walk, this random jiggling would stop. Just one thing it's worth me saying. Imagine this test tube of smoke. Assuming the smoke doesn't stick to the sides of the container and drift down too much. If you think about it, the gas in the test tube is at room temperature and if we leave it in the cupboard, we'll be at room temperature at all times. So once you've set up this experiment, theoretically, you're done forever. If it doesn't cool down and other things don't change, then the gas particles are going to keep moving around on average at about 500 meters per second, colliding with the smoke particles. So you can put it all away in the cupboard and it will be going 10 years, 100 years, 1000 years later. So I do hope you enjoyed that experiment and now have a good understanding of what Brownian motion is and what it shows us about the existence of atoms and molecules and just how small and how fast moving they must be to cause relatively large smoke particles to jiggle around. I'll be making another video soon and I look forward to seeing you then.